welcome back to the next lecture in the series of uh, non motorized transportation in the previous lecture we had looked at uh, how to define non motorized transportation there are different benefits and a generic five step planning process so in this lecture we are going to go into detail about all the five steps that we have learned and uh, in this particular lecture we are going to look at the first step which is assessing non motorized transportation systems and particularly within that we'll be looking at how to determine the city characteristics and the transportation situation look at different institutional and regulatory environment existing in the city uh, map the existing infrastructure and assess its condition and then get into how to determine what scale of an empty infrastructure is needed and who are the stakeholders for that so you may recall uh, this figure which uh, gives you the five steps in the nmt planning process and now we are going to look at the first step which is assessing the situation just a brief uh, overview about the document from which uh, all the material has been taken this is an uh, guidance document again guidance means that it is not a standard so uh, the values or the numbers given in the document may change from city to city uh, however the guidance document uh, gives you a knowledge bank so it uh, it, uh, it is developed based on the best practices from not only india but also uh, cities outside india how they are uh, uh, developing their non motorized transportation infrastructure so this is uh, very helpful uh, in understanding and getting a perspective of how an empty planning process should be uh, the document uh, guidance document has been developed keeping in mind both planning and engineering departments as well as stakeholders from the private professional field so there has been input from all of these three different types of uh, experts groups uh, and based on their input this guidance document has been developed so when we uh, talk about assessing infrastructure or assessing the available infrastructure in the city and so that we understand uh, how non motorized systems can be developed we need to ask ourselves three different types of questions generically we ask ourselves three different types of questions first is is walking a choice of mode so are you walking uh, out of choice or out of necessity that is one very important thing we need to identify uh, parallelly we need to know what is the socio demographics of the city and also what kind of trips are you making you either using the different types of non motorized modes so are you bicycling to uh, work or are you bicycling to uh, a grocery store are you walking only for uh, fitness and exercise or are you actually walking to uh, go to uh, a medical store or go to your work also often so what are the different types of uh, trips that you make uh, using non motorized modes uh, what is your socio demographics uh, how many trips do you make in a day all of those uh, gives you an overview of the transport situation as well as links it with the city characteristics so now you for for that to uh, happen you need to have certain amount of data uh, you need to collect a certain amount of data otherwise uh, uh, your assessment may be very qualitative in nature and we uh, although want some qualitative perspective but uh, having a quantitative perspective along with the qualitative perspective will make the planning process more uh, strong and accountable so the data you can collect uh, the for example the street network data can be collected from any of the city's comprehensive mobility plans uh, the different types of uh, modal shares trips are, are also in the cdps uh, you need to collect accident data which are uh, available in uh, uh, in the indian situation at least they are available in the uh, police firs as well as what is the air quality of your city along different types of roads uh you may uh, that may be available from the pollution control board so these are some examples of the data that will allow you to review the city's characteristics and the transport situation 
So, for example, uh, here is a uh, hypothetical example of uh, the average trip distances traveled by mode. So, if you look here, uh, let me get the pen out. So, what we are uh, what we are showing in this example is uh, the kilometers per person per year travel. So, uh, there is data available from 1975 to 1999 uh, showing that uh, there are uh, 255 kilometers per person per year. So, in this may be uh, one particular city or one particular neighborhood or whatever it is. So, based on how many people live in that city, all of those people put together or per person per year. So, it is a 365 uh, days data. So, 255 uh, kilometers of walking used to happen in 1975, whereas that has now uh, in 1999 it has reduced to 185 kilometers per person per year. Similarly, bicycle data, a uh, bicycle kilometers traveled is also there, car is also there. So, there are different types of uh, data available based uh, to understand the transportation situation in your city. So, what you need to do is uh, just in order to know how much change has happened from 75 to 99, you can simply uh, understand it by using that formula. So, you would see that walking is decreasing, it has a negative percentage decrease, bicycling is decreasing whereas, car use is increasing. So, this kind of tells you, uh, the data kind of tells you what kind of infrastructure is also in place. Maybe the walking infrastructure, provision of walking infrastructure in this particular city is not that good and that is why uh, the percentage of people walking is decreasing. Whereas the provision of infrastructure for motorized traffic or for car traffic is pretty good and that is why a lot of people are using their cars. That may be one of the reasons. So, it kind of gives you a feel for what is the type of infrastructure that is available in your city. The next thing is to understand what based on the socio demographics of your city which are the people who are using motorized versus non motorized modes right so if you look at uh, these two charts you would see that all of these charts are divided up by year and are divided grouped as different socio demographic groups so light blue indicates the group of people who earn maybe less than 5000 rupees per month whereas the and it increases so on and so forth and goes to the dark blue which is they earn more than 50,000 a month. It is just hypoth hypothetical data, but it what, what is shown here is that in 1975 all of those people who earned less than 50,000, uh, 40 percent or just a little bit more than 40 percent maybe closer to 50 percent used to walk and the other shares are shown here. You can then track that in 2002 and see that in 2002 the lower income groups, the percentage of walking by lower income groups has now gone up to 60 percent and you can assess the others. Similarly, the second chart shows you the percentage share of trips by car. So, again having this kind of data from your city, from your uh, comprehensive mobility plans of your cities allows you to understand where your city currently stands. So, in 2002 maybe then if 2002 was the current year, current year currently is 2020, but this data is 10 years almost 10 years 8 years old, but if you have current data then you can plot a similar kind of chart and see what is happening with the different socioeconomic groups. The important thing is to understand whether people are choosing to walk or use non motorized modes or are they captive users. Captive users are usually people who do not have a choice, uh, maybe they are socio economically, uh, socio demographically poor or they live in remote areas where uh, there is not enough infrastructure available. So, they are captive to some kind of mode. Okay? So, that is the difference between a choice user and a captive user. 
The other type of uh, data that uh, may be available in, uh, in your city is trip length based on purpose. So, you see di four different lines here, each of these lines represent, represent uh, whether you are taking making a trip for work or to school, whether it is a shopping trip, whether it is a recreational trip or whether it is a social visit trip. And then the y axis represents the people, number of people in crores and the x axis represents the distance in kilometers. So, you see as the distance increases, the propensity to uh, use uh, non-motorized modes for different trip purposes decreases. Right? If the trip distance is very less, so if it is a very short trip, less than 1 kilometer or even bef between 2 to 5 kilometers, more number of people are likely to use non-motorized modes. Right? It is intuitive. You do not want to walk long distances. You do not want to bicycle for long distances. But if it is shorter distances, then you would use non-motorized modes. Whereas, as the distances increase in this direction, you see that the number of people using non-motorized modes. So, these are all people that are using different types of non-motorized modes for each of these purposes. So, they have a declining trend. So, this again tells you maybe the land use in your city is very segregated. Maybe they have different land uses at different spots. So, they do not have a lot of mixed land use. In that case, what happens is people have to travel longer distances and when people have to travel longer distances, your non-motorized transportation share decreases. So, here is a numerical problem which will help you explain uh, better. Uh, given our two city data from two different cities uh, and different types of modes that are used by the people in the two cities. Again, it is time series data. So, there are three different time periods for which data has been collected. Okay. This now, based on this numerical problem, what we need to understand or what we need to determine is which city is non-motorized transport friendly in between 1996 and 1999, right? Between these two time periods, which city is non-motorized friendly? What is the trend of walking trips in city A? This is only based on city A, walking trips only, right? And finally, what is the trend of car trips in city B. So, car trips in city B. So, these are the three different questions that are asked based on this data that is available. So, in order to answer the first question, which city is NMT friendly between 1996 and 1999? What would you do? You would essentially develop a chart which shows percentage change between those two years. Right? If the percentage change is positive, that means positive in the case of non-motorized modes, that means that city is more non-motorized friendly. Whereas, if the percentage change is negative between uh, am among the non-motorized modes, that would tell you that the city may be is not so non-motorized friendly. So, here what we did was city A is represented uh, in blue and city B is in orange and this is the difference uh, or percentage difference between these two years. So, what we see for the non-motorized modes, right? the non-motorized modes here are walking and bicycling, the rest of them are car, bus, auto rickshaw and uh, motorized two wheelers are motorized modes. So, when we compare these two cities, what we see is that city A is a bit more non-motorized friendly because both of them are positive, right? City A and City B both are positive. Nobody is negative, so they are moving in the right direction. Both of the cities, as far as non-motorized transportation is concerned, but the percentage change in City A between 1996 and 1999 is much better than the percentage change in City B. So we can say that City A is a more a better non-motorized friendly city. The next question was to understand what is the trend of only walking trips and only for city A. So, again we can draw in order to draw trends 
you can because it was uh, three different years were given what you could do was you could see what is the difference in the first two years 92 to 96 and then from 96 to 99 right you can draw such a chart from that table and again on the y axis you can have the percentage change so when we start looking at what are the trends in walking trips only we have shown you all different types of trips here but the question was only for walking trips so you would see that the answer would be that the walking trend is increasing in both 1996 from 1992 to 96 as well as from 96 to 1999 right so it is an increasing trend both cases it is positive and at the same time the increase between 1992 and 1999 was maybe somewhere around 4.7% whereas from 1996 to 1999 that increase has gone up to 4.8 percent so that is also kind of increasing so 4.7 percent to 4.8 percent between 96 and 99 so there is an increasing trend so that also gives you an idea that okay your city is doing good in terms of walking which is one of the mode of non motorized transportation uh, it is doing very good. Similarly, the last question that was asked was what is the trend of car trips in city B? Very similar charts to the previous ones. Here we have again showed you all different types of modes, but the question is only about car trips. So, again, the car trip is also increasing between 1992 to 1999. In both of the cases, so between 1992 to 96, there was almost a 26 percent increase in car trips whereas from 1999 to 1996 to 99 there was almost an increase in increase of 31 percent car trips so this is also increasing so there is city b which we first saw uh, in the first example as is a less non motorized friendly city and that is also now here reflected by the case that it is also showing an increasing trend in car use which is a motorized mode so both of those together you could say that the city b is not so friendly for non motorized transport all right so i i hope these simple examples clarify that how you can use data from your city's comprehensive development plans or comprehensive mobility plans in order to assess the existing transportation situation in your city now the next step in assessing uh, the conditions is to map the existing infrastructure and its condition right it is good enough now to now you know the data what your city's data is what are the trends which are the uh, good trends which are the not so good trends now you have to develop a map of the existing infrastructure that is in place so here again we ask three simple questions are there enough enough nmt infrastructure right and how do you define enough how do you say it is enough for your city or your neighborhood or whatever that is how much of the road is available for walking right there may be a lot of road space pavement space but there may be uh, the right of way may be a lot but is how much of percentage of that right of way is available actually for walking so you are aware that many of the in many of the indian cities the walking space is usually encroached upon by various number of entities such as maybe hawkers maybe parked vehicles uh, maybe utility lines and so on and so forth so walking space although uh, is demarcated but it is always encroached upon most of the times and the third thing to ask is is the built environment conducive for walking now what is built environment built environment usually represents the environment in which you are walking which is a built by somebody it's not a natural environment so natural environment of walking would be walking in the forest walking in uh, some naturally wooded areas but when you're walking in a city usually it is a built up forms so there are different types of built conditions so would you feel comfortable walking uh, alongside a factory 
which is also a built environment whereas in uh, as opposed to would you be comfortable walking uh, alongside a mall so these are two different types of uh, built environments and where would you be more comfortable so that is also a very important question to ask when you are assessing the non motorized transportation situation again in order to map all this you would need different types of data you would need uh, volume data of not only the non motorized modes but also the motorized modes right you would need the type of infrastructure that is available in your uh, in your city is it just paved roads not only paved roads but where are the sidewalks how long are the sidewalks how wide are the sidewalks which are the locations that have zebra crossings right how many bicycle lane miles do you or lane kilometers do you have where are the street lights what are their locations do they cover do they have enough coverage and also when you are talking about non motorized especially about walking uh, pedestrians you have to know where uh, you, your toilets are along the way your public toilets drinking waters street furniture such as benches and all so you have to map these things unless you spatially know where it is it is very uh, it is not uh, possible to quantitatively assess how good or is it adequate enough for your city so all of this infrastructure uh, map um, for mapping the infrastructure all of this data should be available again in your mobility plans or you do yourself collect data using cordon counts and so on and so forth uh, conducting site visits and all so again this is a hypothetical data that we have used again for three different uh, years where we have shown uh, what is the length of infrastructure that is available uh, in kilometers for these different types of uh, facilities a uh, bituminous roads non bituminous roads footpath cycle track and uh, concrete infrastructure so this is just the data that is available now you can easily see that bicycle tracks percentage change from year to year is very low whereas bituminous we are building a lot of roads but we are not including cycle tracks in those roads right so if one used to see, one is used to see only the bituminous pavement length then they would feel that well we are building a lot of roads but that does not mean that we are building a lot of bicycle tracks which are usually marked on the roads sometimes they are off roads as well but many cities or many uh, cities in the west and in the developed uh, nations have bicycle tracks now which are on the pavement itself similarly you would see footpath uh, although is higher than bicycles but is way lower than bituminous roads so although we have roads but we do not have footpaths along those roads not all roads would have footpaths again you have to be very careful when you say that uh, the length of uh, road is equal to, is not always equal to the length of uh, footpath but it has to be somewhere in proportional to the footpath so maybe there is a another classification that you need to find out is the bituminous roads along urban collectors maybe that's what something you have to look at collector roads usually should be pedestrian friendly so then the next step is to identify all the different institutional legislative and regulatory issues in your city right it is very very necessary to understand all this otherwise you would not be able to plan for it so in order to understand all that you have to be uh, familiar with uh, different types of um, uh, different types of plans ranging from city development plan to urban renewal schemes to land use uh, development so you would see that this is uh, non motorized transportation is a, a combination is a is a is a well integrated uh, domain of uh, civil engineering as well as urban planning and architecture so you have to if you are if you are a civil engineer you have to cross over and also know about land use uh, about uh, uh, beautification schemes and whereas if you are a uh, 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 urban planner or uh, architect you also have to understand how uh, the transportation mode shares happen and how all of those happen so it is an uh, interdisciplinary field and you have to know about all these 
uh, institutional regulatory things. So, this is an example of how you can map the existing infrastructure condition, right. So, this is just a short stretch of a street from here to here. Uh, you could know the width of the road, you could map where the trees are, right, that gives shade comfort to people who walk. You need to know what is the land use type that will give you the built environment that is there around it, okay. Built environment again makes you feel, uh, makes your uh, perception of walking uh, different for different types of built environment. You can uh, mark all the public toilets, all the street lights. So, this gives you a detailed existing condition, existing infrastructure as well as condition. So, this map shows just an inventory of all the infrastructure that is available. The next step would be to go ahead and determine the condition of it. So, uh, a public toilet is present, but a public toilet condition may be not that good. So, that also has to be documented. Right, street lights may be present, but street lights are not functioning, half of the bulbs are off, out of order. So, that also has to be recorded. Unless you do record all that, you will not be able to plan for good non motorized structure, non motorized transportation facilities. All right, so this is a snapshot of how to do it. And like I said, you have to then assess it and uh, there are the various assessment tools for non motorized transportation which uh, we are going to get into in the later half of uh, of this class uh, just to give you an idea of what are these tools uh, they are different uh, you can measure the built environment walkability and bicycle by using walkability and bicycle audits you can develop level of service scores for both pedestrians and bicycles to understand how good your infrastructure is and you could do also a network assessment so uh, as well as flow characteristics of different pedestrians and bicyclists. So, all of this will be dealt with in the coming uh, classes of non motorized transportation. Finally, you have to understand the scale of the project uh, which you want to implement, right. A non motorized transportation uh, usually happens, uh, a non motorized transportation project usually happens at four different types of scales. If you do you want to improve non motorized transportation at your city level, if city the entire city is your scale, then you have to consult with your city development city mobility plan or comprehensive mobility plans, comprehensive development plans and so on and so forth. If it is only for an area, so within a city you are only looking at certain pockets for which you want to develop that. So, then you have to look at uh, maybe that is a new township, so there are some uh, township plans, uh, some DPRs for uh, large transit systems, metro systems have DPRs and metro only goes through certain part of your city. So, you can then develop uh, the NMT infrastructure at that area level. Similarly, if it is for a corridor, so like I was saying metro, uh, if you are planning around the metro stations of your uh, city, so metro runs on only particular corridors. So, you can then develop the NMT infrastructure at that corridor or if it is only for a street which needs beautification, which needs pedestrianization. So, you would see many of the uh, cities now are identifying certain streets in their CBD areas in their central business districts and uh, demarcating them as only pedestrian zones. So, the, uh, the, the uh, land use is very different, it is a uh, lot of uh, restaurants, lot of uh, um, areas where people can just walk to and maybe it is only during the daytime that it is uh, designated as uh, pedestrian zone only during the weekends, during the night. So, there are a lot of those kind of things that are only specific to certain streets in the city. So, there are, there are these are four different scales at which you can implement your non motorized transportation plan. Uh, this is the illustration of uh, what we just said and uh, we are now almost coming to the end of this lecture. Finally, you also have to know what are the funding opportunities. NMT funding opportunities are usually bundled with larger projects. So, one has to be very, very careful during its implementation that these NMT infrastructure is implemented. 
because uh, footpaths are usually uh, not funded separately unless it has to be retrofitted in. Uh, usually what happens is when a road is repaved or when a road is a uh, new road is built, a footpath is built along with it. So one has to be very careful that uh, once the road is the pavement is built, the contractor or uh, whoever is uh, uh, authorized to build it also constructs the footpath as per design. So usually what happens is the funding is bundled together. However, you can also look for isolated funding uh, that are all that are available from various central and state schemes, also local planning budgets and also private funding sources. Uh, many times what happens is uh, if you are especially in a market area along that street if there are all different types of shop owners may pool in money and have the footpath built in. So, those are private sources. So, you need to also tap into such sources to build your non-motorized transport infrastructure. Finally, you have to understand who the stakeholders are. You have to understand who the stakeholders are in order to raise awareness. Right? Many people uh, are not even aware that there should be pedestrian infrastructure at this place or that place or uh, they take it for granted that uh, we just walk on the street, we do not need uh, any infrastructure, but you have to raise awareness among them in order to build these infrastructures. So, based on the scale and scope of the project and also you have to make sure that you have sufficient stakeholders who can influence decision makers. Right? You have to talk to your maybe elected representatives, maybe experts from academic institutes, different government bodies. So, you have to build your case uh, in order to have this NMT infrastructure implemented. Many times it happens is uh, everybody usually loves the idea of uh, having a good pedestrian uh, facility or a good bicycle track, but they do not know how to actually implement it. So, in order to know how to actually implement it, you have to have the right stakeholders in place and raise awareness, raise funding so that these projects are implemented. Here are some references from which uh, most of the material was uh, uh, shown to you. This can be downloaded for free and the third one is a textbook uh, which you can read further to gain further knowledge. So, in our lecture today, we have looked at the first step in the five key steps of understanding uh, of uh, planning for NMT. We have looked at assessment, understanding city level characteristics, what are the different data sources. Uh, to uh, have the information about your city and also how to plan for different scales of NMT infrastructure. Thank you.